Okay, last week we began a summer Bible series called Unexpected Stories. And we really started with the big, epic story of God. And so, let me see if I can get this to work. One more. All right. This was the slide we were talking about last week. You know, that God started uh, all of this with creation. But people continually chose and choose to reject the relationship that he offers. But he is in constant pursuit, trying to restore us to oneness and wholeness, trying to fix the brokenness. And yeah, it's a lifelong process. But God has done everything to redeem us. See, he knows how broken we are, how messed up we are, how even the best of us, you know, where we live maybe even most of our life seeking him, but in the end, we all fail, we all sin, we all screw up. I mean, he knows it. And guess what? In the midst of all of that, he loves us. He adores us. He pursues us relentlessly. And I shared that story about my daughter being lost last week. It's not a relentless pursuit like a dog chasing, you know, a car. It's a relentless suit, pursuit like a daddy looking for his lost kids. It's a beautiful picture. God desires to make us whole and to give us purpose and meaning. But our response is always just to say yes to to rejoice and accept that love. So today's story in this, you know, this unexpected story series might likely be a story you've never heard. I love this story today. But before we jump in, I I, I need to do some background work and I also need some audience participation, all right? But I need you to be honest. I'm going to ask you a question and I don't want this to be like that Sunday school story where the teacher asks Uh, the class to name that furry little animal that climbs trees and eats nuts. And the little boy says, I know the answer is Jesus, but it sure sounds like a squirrel to me. (laughs) This isn't that kind of honesty, all right? Real honesty. What words honestly come to your mind when you think of the Old Testament? (laughs) That's the kind of honesty I'm talking about. You're fired. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Good, boring. What are some, not good, but you know, right. A lot of people do. What are some other words that come to your mind? Okay, old, previous, superseded by the new. Give me history. Harsh. I heard judgment. And what was the other one? Technical. There are a lot of details. Read Leviticus to your kids at night. Beautiful story. They will be asleep by the second verse. All right. You'll be asleep by the third, right? What, uh, what, give me some other words. What? Legalistic. <laughs> Thank you. It was like, blah, 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 because two people. Uh, legalistic, and what was the other one? The Exodus. the Exodus. So that is a great story of salvation. Yeah, okay. So there are some really good stories in the Old Testament, no doubt. Any other words that come to your mind? Foundations. That's good. Fighting and war. God's provision. Interesting how we have these, these stories, uh, these, these parallel or, or actually paradoxical kind of descriptions. I came across a, a quote this week by an actor. His name is Christian Bale. He's one of Hollywood's, you know, big, big actors. And a couple of years ago, he played Moses in the movie Exodus, Gods and Kings. Now, you might be familiar with him from his early days when he was in Newsies. Anybody? I know my daughter's like, oh yeah, love that movie. Some of you might be familiar with, you know, a smaller independent film, Batman, The Dark Knight, maybe. But when he was promoting the movie Exodus, he commented on the character of Moses. This is what he said. He said, I think Moses was likely schizophrenic and was one of the most barbaric individuals that I ever read about in my life. Now, obviously, Christians and Jews went crazy with this one, right? Right? But I I like Christian Bale, and I I figure that he's probably not very familiar with the Bible or with history, because I was thinking there are a lot of people in history and in the Bible who are much more schizophrenic and much more barbaric than Moses of all people. But he was honest, and I appreciate that. He's a guy talking, I mean, from his perspective, he probably didn't read the Bible as much as he read the script. And this is just, just his honest comment. I have a feeling that there are a lot of people who 
have the same feeling about characters in the Old Testament or the Old Testament itself. I mean, how do you reconcile some of the stories of wrath and judgment with Jesus' message of love? I mean, how is that the same God? Anybody else feel this way? Anybody else feel that tension? It's really okay. <laughs> You're not gonna, I'm not going to kick you out. Actually, that's what we're going to be talking about today. I think it's a fair question. How, is God, how do you reconcile God of the Old Testament with the God of the New? Because there are some tough stories in the Bible, in both Testaments. The problem is often that we don't understand the mindset and what's going on behind the story, why things were said and things were done. I mean, we all love the picture of Jesus, you know, fighting against the bullies and the religious tyrants. He stands up to the oppressed. He shows love to everybody. He offers hope to the, to the lepers and the prostitutes. I mean, Jesus is this perfect picture of who God is. And we look at the Old Testament and we go, we don't see that one. But I think a lot of it's because we couldn't, I mean, the Old Testament characters, I mean, they could never have understood Jesus. He was so different. His, the culture was so different back then that I, I think that Jesus would have been like an alien had he shown up. Because God always meets us right where we are. Always. And the Old Testament characters, that story, the Jesus story, it needed to start a little earlier. The culture was so different. God meets people where they are. And then he leads them on a trajectory towards his will. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Because early on in the, in the days of the Old Testament, it was barbaric. These were tough times. I am a, I am a, a lover of history, especially ancient history. And, and you read, you know, during the time of like Abraham, 2000 BC, this is the time when basic laws were being formed for the first time. Civilizations were just being developed. I mean, when Abraham uh, was here, he really, he, if Jesus would have shown up, and started saying the things that we see in the New Testament that Jesus said and did, it would be trying to, to sh tell Abraham about space flight. You know, they thought the sun, the moon, the stars were just out of reach, that they were, there was this huge black canopy, and the sun and the moon and the stars hung from the canopy, and then above the canopy was all the water. And there were holes in the canopy, and that's where the rain came from. So if you built a tower tall enough, babble you could touch the canopy but that was the end that's what the universe was to them so if you'd have said hey but we we, we how, how do you say to somebody we now can do space flight and they go i don't believe in space how do you tell them about space flight? it's just impossible i think that was the kind of difference Jesus saying some of the things he did and you've been talking about those in matthew some of these hard sayings I don't think they could have understood. But God always starts where people are. And he, works, he worked throughout history for Jesus' coming. Galatians 4 says, But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. See, Jesus came at the perfect time. And before it, it was preparation time. And the farther back we go in the story, the farther back we go in history, the farther and farther people are from being able to understand God's perfect picture of his, what his kingdom was like. So, you know, Abraham lived in 2000 BC. So let me paint the picture, kind of. Egypt was the superpower. And it had been, when Abraham was there, it had been the superpower for a long time. Amazing to me is when Abraham went into Egypt, he passed the same pyramids we see today. And they were already 700 years old then. Like, wow, there was, a lot, there was a lot going on. Western culture, as we know it, hadn't even been conceived because it'd be over a thousand years before the Greeks would come along and develop a government and society that is our heritage. I mean, this was so far back. And in Abraham's day and in Moses' day, people dealt with injustice by giving more injustice just in a larger scale. I mean, if you accidentally killed somebody's cow, you might expect them to kill one of your children. If you accidentally killed somebody's family member, you would worry about them killing your whole family in front of you. I mean, it was barbaric. It was so different. So when Moses gave the law to the Israelites, it was revolutionary. I mean, you know some of the laws. He gave a law. But if there is serious injury, you are to take life for life 
eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. If somebody kills your cow, the worst thing you could do is kill one of theirs or pay for the cow's replacement. We go, that's kind of sad. The, the paying part's good, but you can kill somebody's cow and, and we don't, that doesn't sit right with us. But for them, this was revolutionary. I mean, this blew their minds. Think about it. If you were weak or powerless or oppressed or didn't have a lot of resources all, and, and, and you killed somebody's cow, how do you protect your children? Because those who have a lot more power, they're going to overtake you. All of a sudden, Moses gives a law that says, if you kill somebody's cow, you don't have to worry about your children. You might have to worry about your cow, but eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. It was revolutionary. God met them right where they were. Let me ask you this. Was eye for an eye his ultimate plan? I mean, is that his ultimate desire? No, because Jesus comes along and he says, you've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other cheek. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. See, God's ultimate desire is not about getting even. It's about unexpected forgiveness and blessing, serving each other. It, he, it was no longer about forbidding murder, which was a revolutionary law when, when Moses gave it. But Jesus was saying, hate in your heart is just as bad as murder. See, God started where they were, but Jesus showed the true heart of God. And Jesus was saying, don't hate. The heart matters. As you read the Bible chronologically, you can really see civilization becoming more civilized. It really was. You can see God moving his people in a trajectory, preparing for Jesus. Because Jesus was not... His emphasis was not behavior, it was heart. That's why he broke the rules and healed people on the Sabbath. That's why Jesus broke the rules and loved people with bad reputations. The Levitical law said, do not touch lepers. What did Jesus do? He touched them all the time in healing them. Jesus even clarified the most important law in the Hebrew Scriptures. It's called the Shema. And what is it? Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and body. Love God with everything. And Jesus says, yeah, that's the greatest commandment, but there's another one. And love your neighbor as yourself. See, I mean, Jesus took... The, the rules and the laws and the stories that were given in the beginning. And he said, okay, we've, you took those. Let me show you the true heart of God through all of this. See, when you look at Jesus' messages, these are the messages we connect with because they're the foundations of our culture. They, they just feel right. This is what we've grown up with. They're our paradigm or how we see the world. But see, that's not how the ancients saw the world at all. But in this series... I hope that you see that from God's point of view, this is always how he's seen the world. His motivation has always been love. Since the beginning, when God created, his motivation was love. He pursues those far from him. He walks alongside those who choose to follow. He starts where you are and moves you on a trajectory to become more like Jesus. God wants to restore all people to oneness. He wants to restore brokenness. He wants to restore a relationship with him so that you are one with God, with yourself, with others around you, and with creation itself. He wants to heal brokenness. It's a heart thing, and it always has been. So, that was the longest introduction of all time. <laughs> but I think it was good, and I think it was helpful to see because you're going to see something, a story today about heart. So are you still with me? All right. So now, let me, let's get into the story. After the, the great prosperity of King David and King Solomon, Israel split into two, hmm, see if I can get it up, there it is. Israel split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. You just kind of need to know that because that's really important to the story today. Remember from last week that the, the purpose of the Israelites, the Hebrews, the Jews, however we refer to them, depending on the... On, you know, the period of time. 
their purpose was to be priests to the world. And do you remember when I defined a priest? It's, it's somebody who stands in between God and humanity and brings them together. That's the definition of a priest, a mediator, somebody, somebody between God and people to unite them. That was their purpose. That's the definition of a priest. But no different than today, they didn't do very well at that. The kingdom of the Israelites, the kingdom of the Hebrews, the Jews, they did not do that well. And we can judge them all day, but I don't think the church does a great job with that either. So we're not going to blame them. We're going to say, ah, they kept being self-centered. They kept thinking it was about them. They kept doing church or synagogue or religion the way they thought it was best or what served their needs best. (coughs) Excuse me. The prophets warned, because they were doing their thing their own way, that they were going to lose their land if they continued to disobey. And eventually, the empire of Assyria became the superpower. And so here's the empire of um, Assyria. And you can see how little Israel and Judah are compared to the empire. And in the 700s BC, and I know I don't want to bore you too much with dates, that was the last one, but the 700s, Assyria completely obliterated the northern kingdom of Israel, just wiped them out, deported tens of thousands of people into Assyria, and deported tens of thousands of people from outside of Israel into Israel. So now there was just this mix of people. There were some, there were some you know, Israelites left, but there were all these other people, and then they began, they began intermarrying, and uh, that's what created the Samaritans, and it just became this mess of people in Israel, and Assyria had its sights set on Judah next. And the prophets kept warning, Judah, if you continue down the same path that Israel was on, you will have the same thing happen to you that Israel had happened to them. But Judah's king, his name was Ahaz, and he was one bad dude. And I don't mean that in a good way. He was bad. And so, you know, he was funding idolatry. He, was, he let the temple go to ruin. And the prophets warned, Judah, your days are numbered. But thank goodness, thank God, Ahaz's son, his name was Hezekiah. And he was a good king. And the story today is about Hezekiah. Because he decided to point Judah back to God. He was listening to the prophets. But it had been so long since the Jews had worshipped the Lord correctly, like biblically, nobody knew what to do. I mean, like the oldest people in the realm might remember worshipping Yahweh, the Lord. But nobody did. Nobody knew what it was like. But Hezekiah reinstated the Lord's priests, restored the temple. And this is what's really cool. He went and he invited every Hebrew Israelite Jew, every person of God from Judah and even in Israel, those who were left. And he said, come, let's get together for the first united Passover in hundreds of years. The first united Passover celebration since Solomon. Look at what it says in 2 Chronicles 30. King Hezekiah now sent word to all of Israel and Judah, and he wrote letters of invitation to the people of Ephraim and Manasseh. These are two tribes that were in Israel that were destroyed. He asked everybody to come to the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover of the Lord, the God of Israel. So if you don't know, what Passover was like the, the most ancient of Hebrew holidays, celebrating when God freed the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. And if ever there was a time to, to remember the salvation of God, it was at this time when Assyria was looming over Judah. And then it says in the story, the king, his officials, and all the community of Jerusalem decided to celebrate Passover a month later than usual. That's significant. They were unable to celebrate it at the prescribed time because not enough priests could be purified by then, and the people had not yet assembled at Jerusalem. Now, in Exodus 12, we won't read it, God commanded Passover to be celebrated on the first month. But what month are they celebrating it on? The second. So they missed it because there just weren't enough priests to do the work. So they went against God's command and decided to postpone a month. And then look, it says this plan for keeping the Passover, it seemed right to the king and the people. I don't know if it seemed right to God, but you know, the king and the people thought it was a good idea. So they sent a proclamation throughout all of Israel from Beersheba in the south to Dan, way in the north, inviting everybody to come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover of the Lord, the God of Israel. The people had not been celebrating it in great numbers as required by the law. So, I mean, basically, few, if anybody, had been celebrating Passover. 
And nobody ever celebrated as a unified people because the North and South, they hated each other. Too much relational damage had been done. And then let's skip to verse 10. It says, The runners, they went from town to town throughout Ephraim and Manasseh in the north, as far as the ter- territory of Zebulun, which is just about halfway, a little above halfway. They never made it to Dan because why? It was worthless. Here's why. But most of the people just laughed at the runners and made fun of them. People in the north were like, why would we want to do anything with the south? Why would we want to go to Jerusalem? We have our own capital. However, some people humbled themselves and went to Jerusalem, it says. The north didn't trust the south. They scoffed at the invitation. But a few recognized what Hezekiah was trying to do. That few people got it. They joined the celebration. And then it continues. On the 14th day of the second month, (coughs) excuse me, one month later than usual, the people, not the priests, the people, slaughtered the Passover lamb. This shamed the priests and the Levites. So they purified themselves and brought burnt offerings to the temple of the Lord. So the people are screwing up everything. And the priests are like, ah, they're embarrassed. They purify themselves. And then they, they make sacrifices for the stupidity of the people because they're like, what are we doing? What do we do? And then it continues. Then they took their places, the priests, at the temple as prescribed in the law of Moses. The Levites brought the sacrificial blood to the priests who sprinkled it on the altar. And most of those who came from Israel had not purified themselves. So, I mean, basically what you have is the people did not even know what they were doing. They were trying to help, and so they start doing the sacrifices. And, and the priests are like freaking out, and so they make sacrifices for the sacrifices, and then they start doing their job, but it is so busy that it's taking forever. All of the people from the north, they've never even done this Passover thing. That was kind of a Judah thing. You know, they, had, they hadn't been doing this. They hadn't been worshiping the God ever. They never had a good king. So they don't even purify themselves the way the law says to. They just come down dirty, you know, barefoot, stinky, going, hey, let's have this party. They don't know what's going on. Everything was being done wrong. Everybody was continually breaking God's law about how sacrifices should be performed, about purification. They even screwed up the date. In the Jewish world, is this a big deal? I mean, I'm seeing this. Yes. I mean, the law was everything. This was such a huge deal to the, in the Jewish world. And the priests and the Levites were embarrassed. And in your imagination, in your picture of the Old Testament, how would you expect God to respond to their ignorance and their mistakes? <coughs> Excuse me, fire judgment death maybe bringing another country empire down to destroy him that's what we think because that's how most of us look at the old testament god so let's look at what it says first of all king hezekiah he sees the chaos he's probably wondering what in the world's going on this is not what i intended you know by this passover celebration i thought we were going to bring back the days of solomon and here we're bringing back the days of the little rascals you know For those of you under 20, I know you don't know what that is. That's okay. (laughs) It says, but King Hezekiah prayed for them, and they were allowed to eat the Passover meal anyway, even though this was contrary to the requirements of the law. (coughs) For Hezekiah said, may the Lord who is good, and I love that, Lord, you are good. We've done, we've been really bad, (laughs) but Lord, you are good. Pardon those who decide to follow the Lord, the God of their ancestors, even though they are not properly cleansed for the ceremony. They're trying, God. They're seeking you. They're screwing everything up. Heal them. And look at verse 20. And the Lord listened to Hezekiah's prayer and healed the people. That's it. Their mistakes, their ignorance, their sin, healed. They were seeking God. They were doing the best they could with what they had. God was pleased. That is not a picture most of us have seen of the Old Testament God. But that is the picture from the very beginning. God is a God of love. People think the Old Testament is about law and wrath and the New Testament is about love and grace, but the God of both Testaments is the same God. The people were seeking him. They were reconciling with each other. They were worshiping the best they knew how. See, what mattered was heart. Not what they did, but why. And that sounds a lot like Jesus. Because God, listen to this. This is important because some of you are going, yeah, but it does matter what we do. Of course it does, but for different reasons. God doesn't love us more when we behave. 
please hear this. Because some of us in here really struggle to behave. We str- maybe we have an addiction. Maybe we, we just don't care. Maybe our parents write us, or maybe we grew up in a church environment that basically says, no matter what you do, God doesn't love you. And so we're dealing with it, but God does not love us more when we behave. And he doesn't love us less when we sin. This is so big. And so many of us, we might even know it in our head, but in our heart, we don't feel that way. God loves us the same. He loves us, period. Why? Well, because he does. So what about our sin? He dealt with it on the cross. He dealt with it. Listen, God's ultimate goal for our lives is not for us to behave. This is such a big deal. Let me put a... I've been saying this to myself since I was a, first became a believer. Somebody told me this. I've never forgot it. Jesus did not die to make bad people good. He died to make dead people alive. See, good and bad, behavior is not the goal. Life is the goal. Restoration is the goal. Wholeness is the goal. See, forgiveness is not the end. It's the means to the end. Forgiveness offers life. Obedience is the result of life. It's not the point. Think about it. During Jesus' ministry, the Pharisees were trying to change everybody's behavior. And what did Jesus call the Pharisees? Hypocrites. And you know, churches, we try to do that too. We try to change everybody's behavior. But it's like if we could get everybody in the world to behave, finally God would love us, accept us, and bless us. But think about it. Let me ask you this. If everybody in Algoma or the peninsula or the United States or the world, if everybody started behaving, would God finally be satisfied? Of course not. He already is satisfied. God is satisfied. Why? He's not satisfied because of what we do, because, oh my gosh, he would never be satisfied. I constantly screw up. He is satisfied because of what Jesus already did. God became a man and paid our debt. That deserves an old-fashioned amen. Amen. Because, I mean, you think about it. We, in our power, could never behave enough. We can't do it. I'm not equipped. You aren't equipped. We don't have it in us to behave perfectly. Thank God that's never been his, his, the thing he's looking for. He's looking for a heart that seeks after him, be, that is responding to him, seeking after us. That's what it's about. And, and there was a problem. It was called sin. And so God said, they can't figure that out. They can't deal with sin. I will deal with sin. And he becomes a man, dies on a cross, rises again. Ah, that is such good news. Now, please don't get me wrong. Sin is not okay. It causes brokenness and it causes damage. It ruins relationships. It causes people to not enjoy life. It destroys. Sin robs people of of good and wholeness. But God is not the cosmic principle with the ruler waiting for people to screw up so that he can slap their hand or give them detentions with a big old smile on his face, you know. (laughs) That is not God. Jesus already died to take care of the punishment. Justice is met. The debt is paid. So look at Romans 8.1. It says, therefore, now there is how much condemnation? Isn't that a great word? No condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. But what if I sin? The debt is paid. We are free to stop worrying about how to please God in committing sins that we don't even know about. Do you know who did that? Who were professionals at that? Worrying about sins that they didn't even know about? The Pharisees. They were so good at worrying, worrying, worrying. But what the Hezekiah story tells us is that from the beginning of time, God's like, stop worrying. There's no condemnation. Seek me. I've been seeking you. I've been pursuing you. Seek me with your whole heart. See, that's the point. To love God with your what? And to love who? Your neighbor is yourself. Love God, love people. And loving people does not mean making them behave. Church, people of God, we don't have a great reputation in the world. And the reason is most, most of the time is that we keep 
trying to tell other people how to live in a way that we don't even know how to, we don't even live that way. We, we sin, we just don't tell each other. We hide, you know, we're, we're smile, come to church, everything looks good. I'm thinking how many times as a pastor have my wife and I fought on the way home or fought on the way to church and then you walk in, oh, everything's good, holding each other, <laughs> everything's wonderful. Yet we're telling the world, don't do this and be like this and don't believe that. And that is not love, telling people to, to, to behave. It, it's not our job to get the world to stop sinning, thank God, because we can't. I can't even get myself to stop sinning. It's impossible. When the Pharisees tried to stop other people's sin, Jesus called them hypocrites. So God is working in us, not to be good boys and girls, but to be more and more like Jesus. That's what God is doing. God wants our heart. He wants our deepest desire. He wants to be our Abba, our daddy. And remember, (laughs) excuse me, behavior is not the point. Life is the point. Behavior, acting like Jesus, thinking like Jesus, that is the result, not the point. In the words of the psalmist, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. If you see God as the Abba who loves you, who is pursuing you, and you delight yourself in him, you will get, you will be delighted. You will get the desires of your heart you will find satisfaction and meaning. See, the Pharisees show that we can behave because let me tell you, I promise you this, none of us in this room were as well behaved as the Pharisees. They were behaved. And they showed that we can behave and completely miss God. But Hezekiah's Passover shows that we can mess up, but if we love God and we seek him, if we, if we love and serve and are trying to be reconciled with other people, God is pleased. That's good news. So relax and know that God is for you. Seek to know him. I mean, read his unexpected stories. Learn to talk and to trust him. Every day, seek opportunities and ways to love people. Can you imagine what the impact of God's church would be if we stopped trying to change the world's behavior and instead sought opportunities to love them and serve them? It would change everything. Remember, we talked about it last week. We're the hands and feet of Jesus. His tangible presence in the world. He uses us, crazy, I wouldn't have chosen us, but he uses us to bless and to draw, to bless the world and to draw them to himself. So who do you need to serve? Just a little bit of self-reflection. This is not audience participation. Who do you need to serve? Is there a relationship that you need to reconcile? Is there somebody in your life you're not right with? Like the north and the south, Israel and Judah, they were bitter enemies. I mean, went to, they, you'd think they were brothers, but they went to war with each other numerous times. They would, they would go to other countries and say, hey, help us attack my brother. Yet there was that reconciliation and that Passover. A couple of people, not a lot, a couple of people got what God was doing and joined. Is there anybody you need to reconcile with? Is there forgiveness you need to ask for? Is there forgiveness you need to extend? Have you been holding a grudge? Because see, these are the things that Jesus did. God wants to work in you. You can't do it on your own. God wants to work in you to bring this kind of behavior, the kind that reflects Jesus, the kind that says, I love you because I love him. I seek you because he sought me and I seek him back. So stop worrying about behavior. Learn to delight in the Lord, to rest in the freedom you have in Christ. Always remembering behavior is a result, not the point. Seek God and love people. You know, you might need help doing that, and I get it. Maybe you did grow up in a church that really taught that God didn't like you. A lot of us did, because we're sinners, right? Maybe you have questions about following Jesus or desiring God. What I want to ask is that you let me know. Every week, we have these connection cards in the bulletin, and I talk to Sean every week. I'm going to get them. And if you have any questions or just you would love some direction or you're like, I need a resource, or listen, we have an elder team. We have a church full of people that I can ask as well. Well, I'll get with you. You Give me your email address. I'll email. I promise, uh, you know, I don't want to spam you. Um, If you give me a phone number, I'll call. But 
on that connection card, let me know what's going on. Or, and I would love to hear your story. Um, and I would love to help direct you in any way. And so um, please do that. All right. Hey, I did good. I have 12 seconds left. <laughs> <coughs> this is weird, but this is such a weird topic and kind of a paradigm shift when it comes to Old Testament or New Testament. I get that. And so you might have some questions about that as well. Put those on the card or just say, I have questions. Could you email me or whatever? I would love to do that. Fair enough? All right, well, let's end this message with a prayer like we did last week, a corporate prayer where we say it together. And what it is, is it's some of the scriptures that we use today, ending with Psalm 139, um, two verses in that. So, (coughs) I didn't cough much, so glory to God. Would you uh, read this aloud with me? Dear Lord, please help me to delight myself in you. Help me live in the freedom, knowing there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Search me and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me so that you can lead me in your everlasting way. Amen. Thanks.